So it's about learning how to simplify it in a way that your audience can easily understand it, whether it's one person or a thousand, and learning how to set frames so that people understand the context that you're working within. So that's that's probably one of the beliefs that I highly recommend. Uh, Men, welcome back to the Men on Purpose podcast. Zach Dean here with special guest Callum Hock. Thank you for jumping on, brother. Thanks for having me, Zach. Great to be here. For those of you who don't know Callum, I'm going to do a quick little intro, but I'm really excited for this interview. We're going to talk about all things communication. A lot of what we talk about here on the podcast is around wealth and health. And the third point is communication, which is a vital part of becoming a man on purpose. So who is Callum? Callum Hock is one of the youngest practicing master trainers in the world, having achieved his master trainer, AB, NLP accreditation at the age of 36. He's driven for commun- for connection. That's what his business is all around is connecting coaches and experts and leveraging the seminar um, strategy as well as presenting from stage and bringing people together. So I really love that is bringing community together. And one of the main things that Callum loves and respects is storytelling. And he has some amazing stories to share with us today on how to be a man on purpose. So I'm really excited for this. You guys can check out Callum's work. I'll put the link somewhere around this video and let's jump into it. So Callum, how did you, where did this story begin for you? Tell us, tell ah. us the, the beginnings of, yeah, of sure. how you really start to value communication. Cause I feel like communication has been lost. You know, this art of communication, storytelling is just lost. And um, I value it highly. Yeah. 100%. I, um, I mean, for me, the, the journey really started when I was quite, quite young. I uh, was staring out the window, looking at the moon actually, and just, really trying to figure out what the hell was going on, (laughs) um, figuring out, you know, even as a young man, what, what I wanted to do with my life, what the meaning of life was, what my purpose was. Um, and you know, I remember thinking in that moment, I started, I guess I started, it was a process of becoming more self-aware and that really drove me that self-awareness, uh, or that, that birthing of that self-awareness at that time really started to you know, pushed me into wanting to ask heaps of questions about who I was, what was my purpose in, in being here and, and what did I want to do with this precious thing that we call life. So that sort of spurred on my, um, you know, personal development, you know, experience my personal development drive and, and wanting to be better and, and learn more about myself. Um, and often, you know, that leads us into the, the spiritual domain as well. So, you know, I went, I went down that path uh, for quite a while. I was inspired. Um, I was inspired by books by uh, like Shantaram, uh, by Dev, uh, David Gregory Roberts, which is now turned into the famous Apple TV show. Um, and I was also inspired by you know a lot of Paulio Coelho's books and Eckhart Tolle and uh, Celestine Prophecy, all those sorts of things. And that that kind of just started this flowering of of self awareness. And and I I think that with that you start to want to explain what's happening to other people. You want to explain your experience to other people. And I found that that was a skill that I wasn't great at. It was a skill that, you know, really took some time for me to fully develop. And, um, you know, I I wanted to explain some of the experiences I had to my friends, to my family. And uh, yeah, that was, that was really what drove me in the first place to learn different methods of communication and you know becoming more aware of myself which is effectively i guess becoming more conscious of yourself awareness and conscious i I feel like uh, go together hand in hand and then being able to articulate that to other people helps you to get clarity in your mind and helps you to get certainty in your mind about about those experiences and i feel like that's that's a big part of that uh human interaction that human experience that we have together is sharing those experiences um so that that drove me into a world of exploration of, of wanting to find what it was that I was um, here to do. I, I remember when I was a very young man of, of working age, I just, I just started working. I was about um, 16 or 17. And, you know, I noticed that, you know, when I looked at my dad, who was a, you know, a hero to me, you know, still is to this day, he passed away in 2011, but he was a hero to me. And I looked up to him and I, saw how he would just jump out of bed every morning. He was so excited just to get into the day and get, you know, just so just full of life and ready to get started. You know, he, he owned his own plumbing company. He was a very hard worker. And, uh, 
you know, I, I wanted that same feeling. I wanted to experience that same thing that he did when he jumped out of bed. And it was, it was frustrating to me because at the time I just, I was not enjoying what I was doing for work at all. I was only working on the holidays, but even with school, looking at what I was going to do in university, what I was going to do after, I just wasn't inspired by anything. I wasn't excited. Um, and I, I used to ask my dad all the time, I, I'd say, you know, how do you, how did you find this purpose? Like, how did you find this passion that you have uh, for what you do? And he used to tell me stories all the time. They still stick with me today. That's a beautiful thing about stories or metaphors. They continue to give new insights to you as, as you get older. Um, and I remember him saying to me that what he did was he found something that he was really passionate about, something that he absolutely loved, that he felt driven by, and he used that passion to help people. And he said that was the equation that he used. When he found something he was passionate about and worked out how he could use that passion to help people, he said that was his purpose. So I went on a bit of an adventure. Uh, I went around the world twice looking for my, for my purpose. I thought it was traveling for, for quite a while. <laughs> That's what I spent a lot of my time doing in my 20s. You know, I'd work for a year, go tra you know, traveling for six to 12 months, uh, and then, you know, repeat that process. And, you know, I went to some beautiful places, met some amazing people. Um, but still at that time, I hadn't, hadn't found uh, what my purpose was. That, that took a little bit longer, but um, yeah, that's a, I guess a, a little bit of a quick insight about how it all began. So interesting. It's so great that you had a dad that was like that, you know, that's, that's really, really rare <laughs> to be honest yeah. with you. I think you touched upon a really cool point. You mentioned, uh, you know, when you were younger, this is before the interview, you mentioned, you know, when you were younger, you were, you had such excitement for the future. You had, you know, the future looked bright. And obviously over the last couple of years, there's been different things that have caused uh, a, a dampening to that excitement for, for many people. So I, I would ask you like, so how do you keep the vision for the future exciting and bright again? Like, like maybe you, you once had as a kid, I think there's so many people out there, myself included, of like, you know, you grow up, life happens, there's bills, there's work, there's like debt, you get a parking fine, like all these things you don't even know existed before, <laughs> like getting into the real world. Um, but maybe that's just part of growing up. I don't know. So yeah, did your yeah, dad teach I think it's a part I think it's a part of growing up. I think I think um I think that I've just made it so that I have no choice anymore, but to have a, a good outlook, have a bright outlook. I mean, I've just recently become a father for the second time. Um, I've got two little girls now, one's two and a half, one's six months old. And when, when you become a father, you know, you, you want that for your kids. You want for your kids what you had or better than what you had or doubly as better, 10 times as better than what you had. And, you know, for me, despite everything that it, that's happened over the last few years, I want the absolute best outcome for them. I want those girls to grow up with the same opportunities. You know, I want to see them thrive like I have. I want them to be able to have the experiences, have that, you know, love for life and, and that, you know, that drive for exploration to find out what their, their purpose and passion is, you know? So, um, I guess for a while there, I, you know, I sort of fell into that before I became a dad, I, I fell into that, you know, <laughs> apocalyptic worldview that seems to just be projected out at the moment. Um, but as soon as I, I remember, as soon as I saw her, my, my first daughter come into this world, I was like, you know, it's, it's, it's a must. We must, you know, we must create something beautiful. We must have a beautiful outlook. We have to, I guess, redesign the paradigm, uh, Zach, you know, um, I, I did feel growing up like there was so much opportunity. It just felt like it was like this Goldilocks era almost where, you know, anything was possible and you could sort of drift and wander and explore and, and learn and, you know, spend your twenties almost figuring out what you wanted to do. And I, that's what I did. I, you know, I was working, I went to uni. I also did an apprenticeship. Um, I was in the, you know, coal and gas industry for a while. That was the thing that sort of propelled me into getting into what I do now because I was absolutely hating it, as I mentioned before. But that entire time, even though I was going on that journey, the future still feel, felt bright. It still felt exciting. It still felt there was like potential in the air. You know, there was still 
you know, opportunities available. Um, so, so I guess for me, Zach, it's about not having, not letting myself have a choice, but to create a brighter future for my girls and, and also for my clients, my friends, my family. And, and I think that's sort of how fatherhood has changed me quite a bit. You know, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's made me get nostalgic about the past and also want to enhance the future for, for them. Touched upon so many great points there. Um, and that's so beautiful. Congratulations on, on the, so how, how old are the kids, the, the, your daughters? Yeah, I've got Indiana. She's two and a half and Olive, who was just born, she's just turned six months old. So wow. yeah, it's a pretty special time. That's amazing. I have no kids just yet, but um, I'm sure I'll be reaching out for some some uh, father advice. <laughs> well, I think that, that's that honestly that's the that's the first thing I did. I, I remember, you know, as soon as I heard that my wife was pregnant, that's the first thing I did. I, I reached out to other men I respected, you know, men that were in positions that I felt were, you know, similar to my dad. I didn't have my dad anymore, like I mentioned before, he'd passed away in 2011, but. You know, I, I had a lot of great men around me and they were fathers as well. And, you know, I wanted to sort of get the, the heads up on the things that I can expect, some of the things to be mindful of and, and look out for. And, you know, they were, they, were, they were fantastic at that. So I think that's important. I think that young guys growing up these days, we, we, should, we should start to make those connections and, and look forward to things like fatherhood because it is exciting. It's, it's tough. It's challenging. You know, it definitely hasn't been easy, um, but it's been one of the most rewarding things that I've done all the same. What's going on, you purpose-driven human you? Thank you so much for checking out this interview. Zach Dean here. If you had any aha moments or questions, please put it into the comments. And while I have you here, I'd love to ask you a quick but powerful question. Do you ever dream about turning your passions and purpose into a business that helps people and makes a profit, but you don't have the energy or skill set or community or training to do so, then listen up. I've actually created this. This has taken me 10 years of working with over a thousand people in the health and wellness industry. I've created what's called the 28A Club. These are 28 actions of specific biohacks that give you the optimal energy, focus, and results in all areas based on quantum science and quantum biology. As you know, the frequencies in nature, when we align to them, allow us to become our fullest version. They allow us to become a high performer. When we disconnect from nature, we become a low performer and it doesn't help to activate our purpose in life. And so if you'd like to download this, this is a free copy. Go to www.28a.club slash join and you can download it, join the club of us high performers and I look forward to seeing you in there. Amazing. And um, I think, I guess the question is, it's like the, the limiting belief I have, it's like, I'm not ready. But, I, you know, are you ever going to be ready to have kids? Is that always going to happen? Is I, that just a belief that I'm holding on to? I, it's a belief I had. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, and I really don't think anybody's ready for it. I think, you know, parenthood, not just for the, for the guys, but for the girls as well. Parenthood is, is something that you learn on your feet. It's, it's, it's very similar to starting your own business. Um, you know, you have all these little pains to begin with. You're really not sure what you're doing and you're, you know, you're flailing around just trying to figure it out as you go. You're often, you know, not sleeping through the night and, you know, there's this urgent thing that you need to tend to, you know, and, uh, uh, it's, it, it, it helps you grow. It's, it's, a uh, it's it's probably one of the best personal development programs I've ever done, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's it's special. Oh, a hundred percent. Oh gosh, there's so many so many questions I have. But um, you touched upon a, a really important point here. You mentioning your dad who who was so passionate to get out of bed. You mentioned yourself, you know, growing up that the future looked bright, and then you mentioned you know the importance of purpose and really you know having that self awareness. Um, and that, that spiritual aspect to it that you mentioned before and doing your own kind of uh, um, discovery in that. Um, maybe for me, this is one of the reasons I started this interview series, because I feel like as the world got more heavy in terms of the weight of the world, so to speak, as growing up as, as a young man, I feel like the more that I got clear on my purpose, the more there was light at the end of the tunnel. And so I'm really, really passionate about purpose, but it's like, people ask me like, how do you create purpose? What's the strategies? Do you have any ways of, or any insights into 
finding your purpose? Yeah, for me, it was just doing heaps of stuff, heaps of different things, putting myself in, in different environments. Um, you quickly find out when you put yourself in d different environments, what's important to you and what matters and what doesn't matter. Um, you know, I think traveling was a huge thing for me, being able to meet a whole range of different people from different walks of life, different backgrounds, um, I guess different demographics, different, you know, it was such a diverse uh, experience because I, I was, you know, living and, and speaking with people that were in tribes in the Amazon to speaking to, you know, going to Guatemala to this little co-working hub in the middle of Guatemala where, you know, people had left the United States to go and work remotely there before any of the stuff with COVID happened. It was, you know, let's, let's go and live in this place start, and start our startup down here, you know, and they were very successful people, you know? Um, so I think traveling, it sort of equals the playing field. It takes, um, it takes you to be out of your comfort zone, out of your environment to start to connect with people that you wouldn't normally connect with. And I guess the, the means of that is the fact that you're in the same place at the same time. So that was really great for me because I got to ask lots of questions and I got to talk to people about what they did to get to where they are. And, and um, you know, that was, you know, really important for me to unpack, you know, what about what they did or didn't do did, you know, appeals to me. Um, so, but it was also that coupled with this strong driver for me that I, I wanted to get out of, you know, I'd have these long periods of travel where I was just felt alive and excited and kind of like I was living my passion. Um, but then I'd have to go back to the, the coal and gas industry, which I absolutely didn't like. Um, and yeah, that was, that was kind of my driver. So like reading lots of books, traveling, talking to people, being in, in environments and having conversations with people that you think you might like to do what they do. You know, generally it's like you're seeing this, you know, as you look around at the world, you're seeing all these things, but this one thing stands out to you like a diamond shining in the, in the light, you know, um, go and explore that, go and have a look at what that is and ask yourself why you like it. Ask yourself why it's important to you because it may not be that thing that you like. It may be a characteristic of that thing that you like. And, and then you, as you start to collect more and more little precious diamonds and you start to, you know, look at the characteristics of each of those diamonds and why you like them, that ends up building the, the, I guess the purpose or the, or the passion for you in the future. And that's, that's certainly what it did for me. Little role play here, as you're saying that I love what you're saying. And what if someone says to you to like, Callum sounds, sounds so kind of mystical, like really bro, I'm, I'm struggling, you know, I'm in a bunch of credit card debt. I've got my mortgage, you know, I've got a bunch of kids and my marriage is, un, I'm really unhappy. You know, I'm really on the verge of um, fig wanting to potentially leave this planet and end it. Um, yeah. my mind is like, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. You know, I, I, I just can't get out of that, you know, in a dialogue and chatter. What do you say to that guy? Yeah. Well, I mean, for me, like I, I was, I was in a similar position, I, you know, if for anyone, by the way, for anyone that feels like they're about to end their life or, or whatever, they need to go and see someone straight away. They need to go and put their hand up, go and see a professional and get help. That's, that's what those guys need to do in that, that position. But if you're in just in that grave fog of, you know, what is my future look like? And it just looks dim. You know, one of the things that I did, and this is what propelled me forward massively was I went out and got a coach. Um, you know, I went out and did some personal development trainings. Um, those trainings are what got me to where I am today. And a big part of those trainings is learning how to communicate with others and yourself better. Because I feel like a lot of the emotional pain that we feel as human beings is our inability to be able to effectively communicate uh, what it is that we're experiencing and feeling. So that, you know, working on those communication skills helped dramatically. I also learned a, a plethora of different uh, emotional intelligence techniques, techniques that were able not just to give me coping mechanisms for the way that I was feeling, but they actually gave me um, 
the ability to learn from those past memories and those past experiences, get the learnings from those experiences and through getting those learnings, help me effectively neutralize the negative emotions and look at real life actionable steps that I can put into place to start moving me forward. Um, you know, that's, that's if you have the, you know, if you have the ability to go and invest in something like that, I'd highly recommend it. If you're not quite there yet in terms of, you know, if you've got money constraints, then, then reading books, podcasts, you know, um, I, I drew upon a lot of YouTube even still, there's a lot of people that I follow on YouTube that I think give great advice, especially to young men. Um, it seems like one of the great things that's come out of the last couple of years is the, 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 the real leaders, especially the, the men that want to be a beacon of light for other men have started to put their hand up just out of necessity. They, they probably didn't want to go into that position themselves, but they've sort of, they've been discovered through necessity. And, and I feel like I still every day look at those people on YouTube and I draw inspiration from those, um, you know, but I can't, I can't, I can't stress enough the, the power of learning some of those emotional intelligence techniques, um, you know, being able to, being able to let go of the past and move forward is one of the biggest things that gets stuck in the present, uh, gets us stuck where we are and, you know, often makes us feel like we do, we are stuck and we have no options. Um, and I was there, I was definitely there. I, I had, uh, terrible anxiety, um, you know, ranging from extreme discomfort to completely debilitating where I didn't want to leave the house of, you know, I was always very, even traveling, I was always a very social person, always very outgoing. You know, I like to be by myself when I recharge, but you know, I was always someone who wanted to be out there amongst life, you know, and then got hit with this, you know, these feelings of anxiety. And, you know, I didn't, that was so foreign. They came sort of later in my twenties. I, I was like, kind of thought something was seriously wrong with me, you know? Um, but it was through learning these techniques. And one of the things I discovered about anxiety is it usually happens to super creative people. And it us usually happens to people who are incredibly good at visualizing the future. The only problem is they visualize what they don't want to happen in the future happening <laughs> rather than what they do want to happen in the future happening. And it's almost like their unconscious mind, which is another name for the subconscious mind. I call it the unconscious mind because I don't believe it's sub anything. I think it's incredibly powerful actually. Um, you know, it's like the unconscious minds singing these alarm bells and going, you know, alarm, alarm. Like, do you really want to create that? You're super creative. You create everything you focus on and things happen for you very, very quickly. Do you really want to create that thing happening in the way that you're focus on, <laughs> focusing on it happening? And, you know, it's, it's like a, um, it's a safety mechanism. It's a safety mechanism for creators not to create what they uh, don't want to create. And, and there is a little tool that I'll share with everybody now that works really, really effectively for it. And, you know, I caution people to only do this on small things that they're anxious about first, and then they can start to, you know, explore how it works with the other ones. But, and you have to do this on each single event that you're anxious about. But one of the techniques that I use, and I still use it today is whenever I feel anxiety, I imagine, I close my eyes, I imagine the future and I float out into the future. And I actually float out past the event that I'm anxious about. And when I'm 15 minutes past that event, I look back on that event and I notice it completing successfully. And I actually obsess over it completing successfully. And I notice all the finer details of it having what has to happen to make it complete successfully so that instead of focusing on what I don't want, I'm now focusing on what I do want to happen. And I'm now obsessing on what I do want to happen. I'm now obsessing on all the things going right for me, the conversations happening the way that they should, you know, the events and the people coming together and collaborating with me to make it su successful. Um, and if, when I do that, I quickly ask myself, where's the anxiety gone? And, and, and always um, disappears for me anyway. So that's a little, it's a little trick. If you want the, if you want me to really chunk me down into the specifics of, a tool that people can take away right now. That's something that I, I think is very, very powerful. I was there. 
I just went there. I just went there so hard. That was like so real for me. I was like, oh my God, now I'm back here. <laughs> so floating out past the timeline of the future event that I might be having anxiety about, yeah. 15 minutes in the future and then looking back on that experience in a state of positive, successful outcome -ness. Yeah, no, and notice it completing successfully. Notice it like a movie in front of you and visualize it happening successfully. And people always say to me when they come back to now, they say, oh, Callum, the anxiety's gone. That's great. I feel fantastic. But what happens if it doesn't happen that way? <laughs> and, and I say to them, won't you at least have a better opportunity of it happening in a great way if you don't have the anxiety there? And they always say yes. So. Yeah. That's huge. You know, where else do we learn strategies to get out of anxiety? Oh, I'll go to the pub. Oh, I'll have a beer. I have a cigarette. Oh, I'll get into my vape. Like yeah. these, these short lived instant pleasurable things are literally distracting us from dealing that, with. That was yeah. me. That was me. That was definitely right. me in my early to mid twenties. Um, it was those, and we're hearing a lot of it now with Dr. Huberman and, you know, Stanford professor who's doing the Huberman labs. He does a great podcast. And the reason why it's great for guys, I think is because as guys, we need data. We need like the actual, <laughs> numbers and figures to make you know the logical decisions based on what we learn and and he's really bringing that to life at the moment with his work on dopamine i'm not sure if you've you've seen a lot of that but he's he's talking a lot about how we are you know addicted to these short bursts of dopamine fixes that we're getting from our devices we're getting from alcohol we're getting from pornography we're getting from you know all these things that almost are artificial forms of dopamine release in the body and it's actually making us dopamine fatigued um and it's it's leading to a lot of things that people describe as being uh, feeling depressed and not feeling like they can have a brighter future and he talks about having to and there's a lot of people talking about this at the moment having having something to work towards where there's a delayed gratification and and i feel like this is something that I've only learned in later life. It's not something that I've mastered either. So I'm not going to sit here and, and shout it to the world like I'm an expert, but creating goals to work towards that do have delayed gratification where you have to work hard at that every day, actually release this natural, um, you know, natural amounts of dopamine that keep you like fired up, keep you excited and keep you feeling good the entire time. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, you're talking about different strategies and different techniques. You know, if, if you want to, if you want to get started, one of the first place, and you don't have any you know, money to do it. One of the first places I would start is stop smoking, stop vaping, stop drinking. Um, you know, and I'm not saying do it forever, but do it for a period of time. That's meaningful. Do it for three months, do it for six months, do it for 12 months. If you can do it. And it doesn't have to be all of those things at once, but do one of them, you know, especially alcohol. You know, alcohol, you know, I gave up alcohol for 12 months in 2019 and I was amazed by the different environments I started putting myself in just simply because of the fact that, you know, I didn't feel comfortable around the people who were still drinking because I felt like the conversations weren't inspiring, the, you know, the interactions were for me not creative. They weren't, you know, getting me excited and I felt kind of bored in a way. Um, so yeah start start there because that's going to have a profound imp impact on you as well and it's going to start putting you in environments that are going to start to move you towards uh where you want to be i think you know um you know if you keep doing what you always did you'll always get what you always got you know so that's yeah that's something that i think about as well 100 percent, 100 percent, and yeah it is, there's so much great content out there these days it's like if you if you're open to it you're curious you know start asking those questions as you're saying like you'll find the answers and uh i think trying it out trying these things on like that technique specifically um is really really powerful i, I like to think that anxiety is actually just the feedback from our nervous system our body letting us know that something's out of balance something's got to change like it's actually healthy to feel that feeling and just it, without that, then our body would be degrading or getting um, 
injured in a certain way. You know, I, I want to have a little bit of anxiety when I look down across over a, a high building <laughs> yeah. just in case I fall off. You know what I mean? If I was confident, I was like, woo. The like, way the way someone described it to me is that negative emotions aren't bad. It's it's similar to like your dashboard on your car. You know, for those of you who have a car, you've seen a dashboard of a car before. You know, you've got all those different vims that come up and let you know different things that are happening with your vehicle. And some of them are all good and some of them have like red flashing lights. And it's like when we first feel anxiety or negative emotions of a different kind, it it almost starts as like this amber flash and you can see it, but it's not pulling your attention away from the road enough yet for you to do anything about it. And then, you know, you keep driving down the road and you're not paying any attention in, to it, you just keep doing the same thing that you've always done. And then all of a sudden it turns red and you're like, oh, okay, that's something I need to deal with soon. And then eventually if you, if you keep doing the same thing that you always did and you don't change, it starts to get this like audible sound and it's like beep, 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 beep. And then all of a sudden the car stops working. And unfortunately for, for a lot of us, because of our busy lives, and like you said, you've got bills, you've got kids, you've got, you know, work to go to you you often stay focused on those things and and pay less attention to what's happening on the dashboard um but i i think you know what's important is that we do address those things because it helps us to do everything else better you know it helps us to show up better for for our friends for our family for ourselves so yeah yeah absolutely for sure that's such a great metaphor that's so great yeah, it's just, it's, they're just signals and uh, they're there for a reason. You know, I think yeah. anxiety, I, I know now, like I think in the beginning, I was like, I want to be so confident. And like when I was 18, I was like, I just want to be confident, like Tony Robbins and just never feel any fear or never feel any anxiety. And, but now as I'm, gosh, 12 years later or something like that, um, 13, 14 years later, it's like that it's, it's the relationship I have with those feelings. I don't want to feel confident all the time. There's times when I, I want to feel in a state of humility and vulnerability and connection, you know, I want to feel feelings of anxiety. I want to feel, you know, the, the whole gamut and the whole spectrum, the, the rainbow, so to speak, of emotions has a purpose. And uh, it's okay if people are out there feeling those things. It's obviously the relationship and the techniques we have to move through them faster rather than them, them sticking around for a long period of time. It's, a, it's absolutely okay. And I, I want to say this one more point on this topic yeah. is that, um, you know, we're given this device, this human nervous system, and we go into the schooling system and, you know, there's a certain way that they teach us there. And we never really get taught how to use this nervous system effectively. We never get taught about how to learn from our emotions. We never get taught about how, you know, you talked about health before how, you know, different foods affect us and how, you know, that affects different systems in the body and stuff like that, because all that plays a part in our, our mental well-being as well. So, you know, I think, I think it is important to discover those things, to learn how to, to manage your mindset, to be, you know, to work at being more resourceful and more flexible in your behaviors um, because that allows more opportunities and, you know, that's how I, you know, that's how I think that you show up better as, as a human being in the world, um, which I think that, you know, this is a bit of, can be a bit of a controversial topic, but I think that some of the biggest problems in the world can be solved on an individual level, because, you know, if we all did the same amount of work on ourselves um, and we all worked at, you know, figuring out what those anxieties were teaching us or what that anger was teaching us or what that jealousy was teaching us or what that guilt was teaching us, then we wouldn't be projecting out onto the world, our shadow selves, like Carl Jung talks about, we wouldn't be experiencing so much of this unconscious uh, behavior that, that can be quite destructive. Um, you know, in saying that though, I think, I think that's also a process of the human race growing up as well is, is dealing with those things. So I, I think that it's, it's a process. Uh, we're all going through it on an individual level, but it's, we're also doing it collectively at the moment as well. Yeah. That's interesting. I remember the, what do they call them? The levels of consciousness. And I think, yeah, collectively. Claire Graves. Is that, Claire is Graves. that it? Yeah. Claire uh, Graves came up with the system. It's called the, the values levels of consciousness. Um, you know, he spoke quite deeply about the first seven and up to eight. Um, but 
it does describe really clearly <laughs> what happens to us on a on an individual level, but also what's happening collectively at the moment as well. It's it's very interesting for anyone that wants to dive into that. I, I highly recommend it. What was his name again? Or their name? Uh, Claire Claire Graves. Claire Graves, amazing. And there's uh, another yeah. guy called Cohen yeah. or C- Cowan, Chris Cohen or Chris. I, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, spiral dynamics. Spiral dynamics. Yeah, it just it sparked an idea there as well. It's like it's just having having these schools of thought to help us navigate this human experience. As you, as you said, that like no one teaches us how to do this. No one gives us a rule book on on navigating, especially you know being a parent as well now. Um, yeah. but I, I do think there are fundamental laws, you know, I'm really big on studying the, the laws of the universe right now with like first principles of physics and chemistry and biology. And there's, there's things that we're living in this, whether you call it a matrix, whether you call it whatever, whatever we want to call it simulation or just our reality is that when we do certain things, we get a result. And these are the first principles that no matter what, they're going to perform time and time again, they're first principles, you can never define them. Um, and I like the fact that you said delayed gratification, you know, fasting, right? Abstaining from not just food, but maybe sex, maybe um, uh, alcohol or <laughs> smoking or swearing or whatever it is. It's just like grabbing those things that have a control over us and saying, hey, no, I'm going to be the con- I'm going to be the boss here. I'm going to get in the driver's seat rather than you in the driver's seat habit and be the one to lead the ship rather than being led by the, you know, these, these behaviors. So I think that's really, really important there to, you know, our health, our, our mindset, how we speak, how we communicate, um, you know, the, the interactions we have day to day to day in every moment, we're consciously choosing that. And that's what I think is being done on purpose for choosing how we think, how we speak, how we show up every day is a choice. Uh, and it's like, I want to build a build an army of men on purpose, you know, let's like, because that's going to help all of us rise. It's going to help me rise. It's going to help them rise. And I find when I associate with certain people that don't have a purpose, aren't looking after their health, aren't abstaining from things like fasting and things like that, there's they drift. Um, Napoleon Hill's book, Conversations with the Devil, I highly recommend that book, talks about this concept of drifting. And it starts off small. Little things that start drifting are the, you know, one glass of wine here one puff of the cigarette there, uh, you know, check out some porn for, for, you know, this time. And then it just builds and it snowballs into this massive drifting. And that's the human experience is being able to catch ourselves. Um, and I think that ability to catch us myself, I can speak from my experience. If I believe I can catch myself because my identity is that I am greater than these habits. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how do you describe identity and like, how do you help? Sorry, is it windy here? No, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. Oh, so I'm just holding the mic here. Um, yeah. Do do what do you what do you have to say about that? Like, do you find identity is a big part in this this whole equation? Uh, Look, there's a lot in that. I I think that what I what I think is really important is that you talk about these controls that things have over people. Um, you talk about how it, you know it becomes a bit of a slippery slope. Uh, you don't realize that that little behavior at the time can lead to, you know, this ingrained daily ritual that you do that's not productive or not healthy for you. Um, you know, there's a, there's a part of me that goes, it, that's a good and bad experience, you know. Um, you know, it's bad because it doesn't lead to great places, but it's good because it shines awareness on that behavior. Um, because I don't think that anybody does anything with bad intentions like it's it sounds really weird and i mean if you take that belief across some things it it might sound obscure but i think that people generally generally human beings do things with good intentions whether the behavior that we observe is seen to be good or bad i think um they start with a good intention so what i'm saying is that for some people, you have to go down that slippery slope in order to become conscious of the unconscious. Um, and that's, that's a process of, of personal spiritual development. It's, it's about making the unconscious conscious. Um, because if you don't make the unconscious conscious, and I'm quoting Carl Jung again here, but if you don't make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you'll call it fate. So there's a lot of we'll stick with men for the moment because that's what this podcast is all about but there's a lot of men going down that path at the moment and they think that it's just fate 
they think that that's just the way life is, you know, and they're not even aware. They're not even conscious of how those little tiny minute unconscious decisions that they were making along the way led them there. Um, so the good thing, and if we talk about the universal model of change for a moment, sometimes the shit has to literally hit the fan. And I apologize for swearing for your listeners, but it's used for dramatic effect. The, the, the S H I T has to hit the fan. Um, you can swear, bro. It's all good. (laughs) In order for you to actually become conscious of that, which is unconscious in you, those behaviors that you were doing that obviously started with a good intention, but now are leading you to some pretty dark places. Um, so I think that that's, you know, a natural progression that some people go to, but I think what's most important Zach is once it does become conscious for you, that you keep it conscious. As soon as you know that it's no good for you or you found yourself on this little obscure dirt track that's led you to a dead end and you're aware of it and you know the right road to be on, you need to stay on that road. And that's, I think that's your response. That's your personal responsibility. Um, and that is learned through becoming a man, I believe. I agree. I agree. It's like, yeah, you need to get slapped in the face. Like for example, I went and did Muay Thai in, in Thailand for a month and did some sparring and I thought I was getting good. And then I got slapped in the face and got, you know, jabbed in the face and kicked in the gut and like kicked them. And I was like, Oh, okay. Like pain is necessary in order to learn. <laughs> um, but 100%. I think this is the, the annoying, well, the annoying thing. This is just how it is. It's that unfortunately society or like me growing up, so men on in general haven't had that moral foundation. Because our parents and their parents or whatever the reason or story was, there hasn't been a guiding set of core values, core principles to have a backbone. Like my, I had multiple stepdads. I didn't have a dad who was like, Hey, this is, this is how you be a man. And, and the other stepdads didn't do that either. And so I learned how to be a man through trial and error. You know, I've had to throw myself into experiences and learn what, what is this masculine aspect of me? What is this feminine aspect? Like w- there's a time and a place for both. Okay. Well, when I'm more masculine in this environment, this is more of the outcome. And when I'm more feminine in this environment, I feel like they both have a place. But I think what you mentioned there is like, there hasn't been for most men that grounding and that ability to self-reflect or self-critique or self-analyze coming back to, oh, um, I'm drifting right now or like, Oh, I'm, I'm doing this habit. I know I shouldn't be watching porn. I know I shouldn't be going gambling and doing pokers. I know I shouldn't be doing this, but they're doing it anyway. And there's, there's no accountability there as well. I feel like, yeah, if someone was there to slap me every time I kind of drifted, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd want that, even though it'd be painful. Like I want that slap, but maybe that's, you know, that's the human experience. No, I, th- I, I think, I think that that can be replicated. I, I don't think okay. that, yeah, I, I don't think that you necessarily, I, I feel like this, if I, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a great father, but if I didn't have, and I did see glimmers of, of attributes or men out there that I wanted to be like, I would, the first thing that I would do is I would hurry my ass into a p- position where I can learn from those people, whether it be on YouTube, whether it be reading their book and extract what their values are. You know, find out what their beliefs are. Look at what they do on on the daily. Look at what actions they take. Look at the environments they put themselves in. Look at the people that they spend the most time with and start to replicate that yourself. That's, That's what we do to learn to walk, Zach. You know, we don't learn to walk, you know, from an instruction book. We learn from looking around at our older siblings or our parents walking and we start to fumble through it and we start to discover, oh, okay, well, I'm on my hands and knees now. I'm skull dragging myself across the floor. And then all of a sudden you get strong enough to hold yourself upright and you stumble a few times, you fall over and then you take your first steps and you graze some knees, you graze some elbows, but eventually you start to walk and then jog and then run, you know, and that same modeling process. And this is why I love what I, um, what I've been doing with, with, you know, NLP and other things. It's a process of modeling. It's a process of modeling other people's behavior, people that do things excellently, people that you look at them and go, that is, those people embody excellence for me. How can I embody that same excellence? What is it that makes them excellent at that? And how can I replicate that? And that's, it's no different from walking and all that it takes 
is to start asking questions, is to start looking at what is that, what are the decisions that that person makes in the daily that makes them different from everybody else? What are the values that they hold dear? What is important to them? What does motivate them? What are their belief systems? What are the structures of those beliefs? What are the attitudes that come off those beliefs in terms of how they act? How do those people, and this is a really important one, but how do those people act in stressful situations? What do they do when they're feeling under pressure? What do they do when they're feeling stressed and what, what rituals or what habits or what um, processes do they walk through in order to be the person that I'm seeing? And the really special thing about what the greatness that you see in them, Zach, especially if you've read any of uh, Carl Jung's work, and if you can't tell already, I'm a bit of a fan. Um, But if you can see it in somebody else, it's also in you. Because you cannot see that outside of you, which is, is not already in you. So if you can see it in somebody else, if you can see it in a mentor, that that same potential is inside of you and you can replicate it. So that's what I would do. Yes, modeling. So glad you, you, you brought that up. It just makes me think of all the habits, all the things that I've learned, all my behaviors. I'm probably just modeling other people and I'm probably... Absolutely. Uh, yeah that's, that's like, what we do we're, we're learning devices yeah so this is a great little segue i'd love to chat more about the communication aspect here as well and you mentioned communication with self communication with others you know you've got communication i guess that's that's to the, or and then maybe communication with our relationship with a greater higher power god um absolutely what uh, and and something I want to also chat about the the set of agreements and values. And you touched upon the the traits and the habits, like all these amazing things here to really to really govern and and direct someone's life. But um, yeah, break down for me a little bit more about the the communication. Like how how does someone start improving their communication with themselves and with others? Let's start with that. Yeah, there's a there's a couple of core beliefs I think you need to immediately adopt if you want to become a great communicator. And I think that the first one is that the meaning of communication is the response that you get. So if, if you're talking to somebody and you're constantly finding that you're not getting the response that you want, it's not them, it's you. Okay. So, so that's, um, that's one of the first things. And it's a good way to gauge how well you're articulating your message, because if you're finding that you're constantly getting feedback from the person you're communicating to, whether it's one person or a thousand people, if you're constantly getting feedback that they're not getting the message or they're not, they're asking questions that show you that they literally have misinterpreted your entire speech or your entire, you know, line of, of uh, conversation, then, then that is something that you need to take on as feedback and there's no failure. There is only feedback. So it's about then learning how to craft because it's an art Zach. It's about a way of creating and crafting your communication, learning to articulate it in in different ways. And I'm not, I'm not talking about expanding your vocabulary. I'm I'm talking about sometimes the best messages are the simple ones. So it's about learning how to simplify it in a way that your audience can easily understand it, whether it's one person or a thousand and learning how to set frames so that people understand the context that you're working within. So that's, that's probably one of the beliefs that I highly recommend. Um, the meaning of communication is the response that you get. The second one, the second one is that in any conversation, in any relationship, the responsibility for clear and concise uh, communication isn't 50-50. So it's not 50% your responsibility, 50% my responsibility. It's 100%, 100%. Okay. So it's, it's my 100% responsibility to communicate in a way that is effective and so that you know you're getting what i'm talking about and you're understanding it and it's also your 100 percent responsibility as a listener to listen in a way that helps you to get what you think you're meant to get out of that conversation help you to understand it at a deeper level and that might mean that you raise your hand when you don't understand so that you can be 100 percent responsibility for for that uh, communication um so so those two, those two core beliefs really set the foundations for, for building um, what I believe is, you know, clear and concise, you know, um, 
great communi- creative communication. Well, most people have probably never heard that before. That that is that's that's a paradigm shifting belief. I would say that if I was to adopt that communication quality, that how I would measure my communication from now on would be the response that I'm getting. If I'm getting a different response and I'm getting the same response, that's my responsibility. So that's quite empowering. Yeah, it's it's also about being flexible in your communication style. You know, um, there's a law called the law of requisite variety. And it talks about the person who's the most flexible in any system um, becomes the most resourceful and most, you know, powerful is the wrong word, but the person who controls the system effectively and doesn't have to be a negative form of control, but it can be a positive form of control. So the law of requisite variety says, if you're the most flexible person in any situation, any environment, then you're going to have the opportunity to get the most out of it. And I think this sort of ties in nicely with creating a, a bright positive future it's about learning ways that you can become more resourceful learning ways that you can become more flexible not only in your communication but in your behaviors so that you can get the best out of every situation so if you apply the law of requisite variety and you look at your communication styles and you adjust it so that you're 100 percent responsible for the responses that you're getting and and you work at that and you craft it it's not something that you know, automatically happens overnight, but it's like, it's like becoming a master builder to be, become a master communicator. You have to put yourself in situations where you're willing to say the wrong thing. You're, you're willing to even, you know, offend sometimes, but you don't just stop there. You keep pushing forward to help that person understand. And I think that um, if, if we stay on that same thread of the future, one of the biggest things that I believe needs to happen right now is for us to all set up some dialogues between the people that we disagree with. I feel like there's been, you know, a, almost like a, by design, there's been an effort to divide people. And even like the subgroups is dividing going in the subgroup and then that subgroup gets divided and then that, that subgroup gets divided. And I feel like we need to start looking at places that we agree and starting from there rather than from places that we, we don't agree. You know, there's, there's this really powerful technique where um, it's called the hierarchy of ideas. And you look at, you know, whenever there's conflict re- resolution or, you know, a situation where there's a conflict resolution taking place, or if there's a negotiation taking place, a really great effective place to start is with the, the intention of both parties. Because if we chunk up high enough, if we get to an abstract level, a more ambiguous level, pretty much all of our intentions are the same. And it's just when we start to get back down into the details that things start to change. So I really think that one of the key things that we need to focus on moving forward is that we need to set up dialogues where we're open to being 100% responsible for our communication. We're willing to understand that if we're getting the feedback that we're not being understood or that the person's misinterpreting what we're saying, that that's our responsibility and that we work towards being flexible enough to find new ways of communicating the message that is palatable for the other person and they're willing to get to a point you know of agreement i think we need to find places of agreement that's that's really how i see us pushing forward is um you know getting getting to, back to that place so that we can you know share those same higher intentions and look at ways that we can both have you know set up a win-win situation for the future i never had any of that growing up that was definitely this is you know this is something that i've learned as a result of going to nlp or going to different communication courses or reading books and and being um uh like failing you know failing at communication has definitely helped me actually value communication there was a lot of when I look back on certain times with my within my family where there was breakdowns or breakups or um, yeah challenges and chaos. It was usually a breakdown of communication and a breakdown of of how one or the other wasn't being heard, seen, felt, understood, right, appreciate like all these fundamental or safe, you know. 
And so I've slowly and uh, over time started to equip myself with different strategies, like what you're saying now. You've got you've got an amazing toolkit and vocabulary, I guess you could say, or insight into these core beliefs and different principles to actually bring this to life. Like how does like how do you then bring this into a relationship? How do you bring this into a part, business partnership? How do you like is is there a methodology? Is there a checklist? Like, how can someone? Yeah, I mean, I'm like, yeah. give me the quickest way of bringing this, bringing me results in this area. Look, there, um, there, there's yeah. a, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of stuff, but you know, for the convenience of time, I'll, I'll share one of the most important ones. You mentioned Claire Graves before. You mentioned Spiral Dynamics. You mentioned the different values levels that um, we transition through through life, and I think that one of the most important things when it comes down to communication is understanding the, the values that you have in that context. You know, it could be in your personal relationship with your, your husband or wife. It could be your relationship that you have with your business partner. As you said, it could be with your friends. It could be with colleagues at work. It's understanding what your values are within that context. Um, looking at the, the values of the, the person that you're, you're speaking to. Um, and you know, how do you do that? Well, it's pretty simple. You, there's a little one liner that you can ask people. It's, you know, in this context, whether it be relationships or, you know, whether it be your personal relationship with your partner or in business, in this context of business, what's, what's most important to you? And you keep asking that question until the buffer empties out, Zach, until you've got nothing left to say. Okay. And then when the buffer empties out, you ask again, you know, what else is important to you in this context? What else is important to you in this context? And you get a whole list of different things. You might have 10, 20, 30 things written down on the piece of paper before you fully empty out. Um, and then the process without thinking about it, without you know doing it rapidly so that you're not spending any time processing it logically or anything like that is to scale it one to 10 and you find out what your top 10 values are. Um, and then the person that you're working with does it as well. And what that does is it gives you a clear insight into what's most motivating that person in, in that situation or environment, what's most important to that person in that situation environment. And if you, if you understand that, it's like learning the love languages. You've, you've heard of the love languages before. It's like learning the love languages. If you understand what's, what's important to someone, you understand what motivates them in that context, you can help them fulfill that value. And if you help them fulfill that value, you help them remain conscious, aware, you help them make you know, help to make them feel great inside. Um, so that's, that's one step. If you want to take it a step further, you can even align your values with that other person. So you can come up with some values that are your relationship values together, your collective relationship values together. And you can look at how your individual values get fulfilled within that relationship as well. Um, that's, that's a really fast, easy exercise that you can do with people that are open and willing to do it with you um, to create what we call alignment um, and that allows there to be congruence. I'm so glad we're on this topic right now. This is literally the mastermind I just finished. We, we were in a mastermind with my inner circle. We're discussing values right now. We're discussing the fundamental core values of our team. And then we've gone to then actually define each value. What does that actually mean? And then what is the high level like say we've got integrity as one of our top values, right? So it's like integrity. What is high level integrity? What is low level integrity? Or another value is precision. What is high level precision? What is low level precision? There's embodiment, um, there's results, and then there's um, communication. So is it important to also unpack the definition of the value? It's like, I think in NLP, it was the rules, right? Because it's like, you might have a definition of, integrity and I might have a definition of integrity and it's like, well, I'm being integrous in my definition. And then it's like, well, hang on a minute. This is my definition. So that, that can create chaos or conflict as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's easy, easily resolved. One of the, I'm, I'm going to use a piece of jargon here, um, but it's called a complex equivalent. So we're finding out what the complex equivalent of that value is for that person specifically. And what that effectively means in simple terms is what does that value mean to you? So when you unpack these hierarchy of values, your top 10, and really the ones that are exhibited in your everyday life are generally the top four in each context, top four or five. But what do those values mean to you? 
And this helps expand that awareness. And remember before I said that awareness equals consciousness. So if you expand the awareness on what that value means to you, and then you get your team member or your person in your inner circle to find out what value, what that value means to them, then you can find the meaning because like you said, a word can mean a completely different thing to somebody else. Yeah. So by, by looking at what the meaning is behind that word for that person, it, it al allows you to really truly understand how that person expresses that or how they get that, how they embody that value. And that's another form of communication. This is great. This is so, so important. And so, yeah, the, the complex equivalent would be so how someone for their relationship or what that means to them. And then coming to an agreeance on, on that. Yeah. Specific if you outcome. set up, if you, if you're setting up collective values within a relationship, then you decide on what those collective values are. And then you decide on the meaning of those collective values as well. Mm. And that's, that's bringing you closer and closer into alignment, you know? And it sounds like what, what you're saying here is that there's an importance of the communication with ourselves, figuring out our own values, our own definitions and living by that as our kind of ethos, especially if we've never been brought up in a space that has set some foundation of values, you know, whether it's a broken family or conflict or whatever. I personally, hello, doggy. <laughs> there's a dog here. Hey. Um, and so you want to be on the podcast? Yeah. You've got some great values, don't you? Um <laughs> So, um, and so now what you're saying is like, yeah, to become self-governable is to figure out your own values or own rules. And then in a relationship, business partnership, whatever it is in a team to figure out these values and the definitions, but then what, like, what do you do next? What yeah. you've got the values, you've got the definitions like, all right, we're going to agree to this. This is our vision. This is our mission. How do you actually like, is, is there a way of articulating an elegant way of bringing um, like, Hey, Callum, I saw that, you know, last week, you know, these are our values, but you haven't actually hit these values as you, is a lot of the time there's, there's low values or high, you know, is there, is there a way of actually bringing in a conversation that helps to self critique, self analyze, and to bring everyone back into a state of, um, I guess unity would be the word. Yeah. I think, I think you can do as a team and we do this in our business, you know, a, a yearly values alignment with the team because year on year a business or a company develops and evolves just like a human being does. Um, I think that what's most important in, in real sense on a day-to-day -day basis with values is you understand ways of making decisions. You know, values are where we expend time and energy and resources on, right? So if we know what our values are, then we know what we're going to spend time, energy, resources on, you know, those commodities that are the most important to us. So, you know, inside of a relationship, if we stay with that example, it's, it's about, you know, learning, okay, we know what our values are. We know where we're going to go on our family holiday this year. We know, you know, how we're going to invest our money. We know how we're going to set up our, you know, food, our meals that we eat every week. You know, maybe we're <laughs> um, valuing, like you said, health. So you're going to, order the groceries in this way and not, not this way. And then, you know, if stuff comes up, it's not like, oh, you've gone against our values. You're not aligned. We need to break up. That's, that's not what it's about. It's about, hey, uh, I saw that you did this. It just feels a little bit, you know, outside of the value set that we've set up together. Um, can you explain it for me? Like, and then that gives you a frame to work from, you know, it gives you a frame to speak from. And having frames is so important in conversations because, you know, I was talking to a friend the other day and he, he said, I, I need to have a conversation with my wife about, um, you know, our spending and, you know, how we can consolidate some of our, our expenses and stuff like that. And uh, he said, every time I bring it up, it, there's just an explosion. And I said, oh, when do you, when do you talk to her about it? Uh, generally when she's walking out the door with the kids and about to go to work <laughs> and I'm like, look, I'm not sure that that's the best time to have a money conversation. Um, so, you know, I, I shared with him a, a little tactic that, you know, can use, and it's, it's about setting up frames and it's about letting know someone, the context of the conversation that you like to have first, and then asking them if now's a good time to have that contextual conversation. So, you know, so how he used that or how he utilized that was when she came home that night, he said, 
hey honey um i'm wanting to have this important conversation with you about some of our finances is now a good time or would you like to talk about it later and she said great you know i want to talk about it too but now it's not a good time can we talk about it at lunch tomorrow you know um so coming back to how to use those values in in real world situations it's about when both of you are aware it means that both partners are conscious about those values and you can make decisions you can set up your beliefs your attitudes your behaviors your actions all in alignment with that it's kind of like taking the energy of a light bulb so if you think of a light bulb shining light around a room like you know even the sun shining light around everywhere and and lighting up the earth or lighting up a room that energy is just spraying out in all different directions okay so before someone aligns their values that's generally what's happening so when we align our values it's almost like taking all that energy and funneling it into a, a laser beam and when we funnel it down to that focal point that really specific point our actions together in that partnership in that relationship can cut through steel so having that clear line of communication being like a laser with your with your values and your alignment means that you can achieve and create things much quicker you know so you're talking to, before about you know guys who may not have the finances or the money or they may be in a shitty situation they could be very very close to their the life that they're happy with it could literally just be as simple as aligning their decisions aligning their beliefs aligning their attitudes and behaviors with what their values are generally we feel negative emotions when we're crossing our own boundaries and we cross our own boundaries when we we aren't in alignment with our values and that's when we feel those crappy negative emotions um so that's that's a really powerful tool that people can use and take away absolutely it's so important yeah this is this is relevant for all things communication um first with ourselves, figure out our values, figure out the rules, figure out how our purpose, our vision, our mission, um, you know, start practicing delayed gratification, looking after our mind, our body, our spirit. And this is what I think is, yeah, definitely a massive step in the right direction to become a, a man on purpose. Is there any, any missing links? Like if, if there was a, a template on how to become a man or how to become, yeah, I guess a man on purpose, do you have a criteria uh, look, I, I just don't, you know, I, I feel like I'm a man on purpose, but I feel like I, I'm like a, uh, you know, I was definitely a diamond in the rough. I, I feel like, you know, I've made a heap of mistakes in my life as well. So I don't know if I'm fully qualified to, to answer that question, Zach. Um, but what I do think is that what's most important, first of all, is that you find something that you are passionate about doing. Um, and you know, that can be hard to do. It's not, a, it's not an easy thing to do, but one of the key indicators that you're on, on the right track is that you're, you know, you're willing to, you're willing to say no to other things that you normally would say yes to just to focus on that, just to learn that, just to experience that. Um, and then finally how to use that passion to help people, I think is only going to make what you it's almost like a divine gift that you've been given. You've been given this gift of this passion that you want to share with the world. And then you learn how to help people with it. So you're going to not only make your life better, but you're making other people's lives better. And by doing that, what do you do? You make yourself more valuable. You know, you make yourself more valuable in everything that you do. So, and that almost takes you to a, a point where, you know, what you do, that passion is helping now helping people. So you've found out your purpose a way to craft your life and, and direct your energy into something that moves you forward and to help other people at the same time. And then I think it's about learning how to share that with more people and to create an impact. I think, you know, when you take your purpose a little one step further and you look at how you can make an impact on larger groups of people, I think that that's, um, that's powerful. And I think that that is what drives me forward, not only for my life, but for, you know, and I, I, I think the word's been overused, but like the whole idea of legacy, you know, I've thought a lot about that, reflected a lot about that over the last couple of years since I've become a father. And it's not necessarily legacy in this 
you know, biblical sense, but almost legacy in, in leaving something for my kids to stand upon so that they don't have to start from where I started from so that they can start from, you know, a little bit further ahead. And I can think not just about them, but also their kids, kids and their kids, kids, kids as well. And, and that's, you know, I think that when you, when you zoom out far enough and you look at it like that, you, you, the moments become more precious, Zach, you know, everything that you do, you realize that, you know, you only have a finite amount of time and, and there are so many things that you can do, um, but you need to start now. So I think that's the other thing. You, you've got to stop giving yourself excuses. You've got to stop, you, you've got to stop feeding your own um, inability to get started. And, you know, that's, that's really the most powerful thing to do is start today. And you're not going to know the next step. You, you're not always going to know where it's going to lead you, but at least take the step, at least take the action and, and look at how you can, you know, make it work. I, I have this funny story that I used to tell in the trainings. Um, you know, it was this cl two clients I had at the time. One was incredibly talented and had all the resources in the world to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to start a business. They had a business name and, you know, through the coaching, I tasked them to go and register the business name um, here in Australia. And I just didn't hear from them. They just disappeared. They ghosted me and I, I didn't hear back from them. Then I had this other client who had no talent in what they wanted to do. They had talent in other areas, but they had no talent in what they wanted to do. They were learning on the fly. They didn't know where to start. They were working within a completely different industry and they were starting this new amazing idea. And they just, they just kept going. They just kept taking one step, one step, one step, one step, one step until those steps built up into, you know, a bunch of steps. I'm not saying anything new here, but I think what, what the kicker for me was in six months time, I got a call from this first client crying, like absolutely devastated, completely upset. This is the most talented one, the one with all the resources, the one that could have enacted the idea straight away. And I said, why are you crying for? And they said that their apprentice that they trained 10 years ago, just started a business and they used the same business name that they wanted to use. And this is just one of those uncanny universal things that happened. There was no way of them knowing that that was the name that they wanted to register. But this other person got in first and registered the same name that that person wanted. And I think that what that pointed out to me was that we all get given, you know, this divine spark of, of inspiration. But I think that the universe hedges its bets sometimes, Zach. And I think that it gives those same ideas to a few different people, you know, that can enact it. It goes, okay, I think that this person can do it. I think that this person can do it. And I also think that that person over there can do it. I'm going to give the same, you know, burst of inspiration to them. And hopefully this idea will be birthed into the world, you know? Um, and that's why when you have those little glimpses and bursts of inspiration, you do need to take action straight away because, you know, someone else might get in there first. I swear I had the idea for Uber before Uber. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> a bunch of inventions that just, I never followed through on. But no, I think that's such a great point. That is so, so important there. Everything from the light bulb analogy, that, that shining light to then shining a laser. Oh, that's going to stick with me. Um, and then the legacy point. For sure. It doesn't have to be some grand legacy that's, you know, lives on through the ages. It's just like, you know, what impact do I want to make that's going to make a difference to the next generation in some way, shape or form? This and, YouTube and imagine, channel. Yeah. Imagine if everyone did that, you yeah. know, and that's where I think it is down to the individual to create a bright, hopeful future is to, to work on that themselves. It's that individual empowerment, you know, being at cause for your results. That's it. Yeah. Being, being a cause hundred percent rather than a, a victim to the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, wow. We've covered a lot. I've got a whole page of notes. Like this is, <laughs> this is gold. This is gold. So, you know, this is, this is your everyday conversation. I'm sure with, with the people that you work with and your business. So tell us a bit about the, your, your business, uh, who exactly are you wanting to work with? 
I love that you're wanting to really reconnect people together uh, and helping experts leverage the seminar aspect for communication, public speaking. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So the new venture that we've just kicked off as of about a week ago, it's been something that I've been working on for about 12 months. Um, but it's something that I'm excited to launch. It's called connect coaching. And what we do is we focus on helping people like content creators. We help people who are trainers or presenters already. Maybe they're already doing speeches and keynotes all the time, or maybe it's some sort of expert in a certain field that wants to leverage their expertise and commercialize it in a seminar. So they want to, you know, or not just a seminar, it could be a training, it could be an online recorded course, it could be a mastermind, anywhere that those people are working with groups. Um, and we really want to bridge the gap for them. They're obviously experts at their field. And I'll give the example of a copywriter. Maybe there's a incredibly creative copywriter out there. They have some of the best techniques to model and they want to share that process with the world. And I think that that's one of the trends that I'm seeing at the moment. Um, you know, we saw this huge trend of coaching over the last 10 years. Everyone wanted to be a coach and become a coach. And I think that that's still, that trajectory is still going up and up. And, and now what I'm seeing is this trend towards getting their information direct from the expert rather than having to go to TAFE or go to university. You know, I'm doing a micro course at the moment for South Florida University. And, and the whole idea is about them having access direct to the expert. So I'm seeing this huge trend online at the moment and I'll continue with the example of the copywriter, but this trend is being able to go direct to those influencers or to those experts or to those people that have had those experience before, or it might may even be a mentor and go and model them, go and model their. We talked about, you know, how to become a better man, but how, how to become, you know, a better, better copywriter. Maybe you're a young up and coming copywriter and you want to learn from that person. So them being able to put their message out there to the world through an online training, maybe it's pre-recorded, maybe they do it live. Maybe it's live in a hotel room or a stadium. Maybe it's, you know, something that they go and do a Ted talk on. Um, but what we want to effectively do is, you know, they're experts at being the best copywriter in the world. We want to give them the communication skills. We want to give them the presentation skills and learn, help them learn how to package all of that up into a seminar training or a speech and commercialize it and put it out to the world so that people can connect with them uh, directly. And, and it's about them telling their story. That's one thing that we haven't really touched on too much at the moment, but this, this art of storytelling, you know, one of, since the dawn of time, human beings have used stories to learn from. You know, that's how we learn from other people. That's, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm addicted to listening to other people's stories and how they got to where they are. I just read a book called Endure by Cameron Haynes. He's a bow hunter in the United States and he's also a endurance runner. He runs 200 mile marathons and I was getting ready to run a 21 kilometer half marathon the other day uh, here. And I just wanted some inspiration because I joined in at the last minute and I, I listened to him. Um, but it's about storytelling. It's about sharing that, sharing that that um, thing that they're great at through a story so that people feel captivated by it and they have that deep learning experience and you know a lot of people have been leaning heavily on the entertainment side at the moment with a lot of what we're seeing on social media at the moment i want to bring back some of those deep communication skills and some of those deep ways of of teaching and and for people to learn. And, and that really starts with, and I alluded to it before, but starts with the unconscious mind, teaching people how to be conscious and aware of what's happening at the unconscious level and learn how they can utilize that to train and teach people better. Um, so we wanna take those experts, package them up with the best presentation skills, show them how seminars or trainings work so that they can put one on themselves. Uh, and then, you know, in the back end, we also offer the advisory program where we, come in and we help support their business almost like a general, a virtual general manager, if you will. So they've got, you, you got your virtual assistants, they'll have their virtual general manager that can help them with sales support, with, you know, things like um, coaching and retention, with how to manage their staff, all those sorts of things. So we, we help them with that. The idea is that we're, we're at this, this cusp, I believe, with this transformation of, 
the, you know, all business and industry at the moment with AI and robotics. And I'm actually really excited about it, Zach. A lot of people are worried about it, are scared about it. I'm actually really excited about it. And the reason I am excited about it is because I think that it helps all those people out there wanting to initiate and explore their creative side and find out what their passion and purpose is actually, it, it helps them to have the time to go and do that. It also helps them to do what used to take a team of 10 to do and they can do it on their own now with the help of AI. So it means that more and more people are going to be wanting to tell their story. More and more people are going to be wanting to share their passion. More and more people want to, wanting to share their expertise. And we just want to be the vehicle for people to be able to do that. We want to help them learn the skills, the communication skills, the storytelling skills, the business skills, and, and most importantly, how to package it all together to make it successful. Incredible. Incredible. I am. I'm excited by AI as well. It's saved me lots of time already. <laughs> so much time. time. Yeah. And it's definitely, yeah, I, I can see how it could be a slippery slope for, you know, 10 years down the track or I don't know, five years of singularity, transhumanism. These are some pretty hectic kind of ways of looking at it. I think like most things, our mind will create more pain than actually doing the thing. <laughs> like, like going skydiving was so scary in my mind, but I freaking loved it when I did it. But before that, it was so, so frightening. So I think a lot of people have some apprehensions around AI, but uh, yeah, start using it. I think, I think it can be really, really beneficial. Like the, the output is just next level. Um, and yeah, I want to, I want to upgrade people's natural intelligence, Jack, um, Zach. Yeah. I want to upgrade people's natural intelligence. And I think we do that through creating a culture of continuous learning. You know, people, people need to feel like they can learn things quickly because I believe that they can. You know, I believe people can learn things quickly. It's a belief I have. I don't believe that they need to stay in a four-year university degree to, to learn something. I think that they can learn something through, you know, a seven-day training, a 14-day training, a, even a four-day seminar. I think that people can learn that. So <clears throat> it's about creating a culture of continuous learning so people can upgrade their natural intelligence. And I think that we should redesign the paradigm, switch up the, the conversation a little bit and talk more about how we can you know, in the future, I'm not talking about now, but in the future, we can talk about how, how people can do that, you know, um, upgrading their natural intelligence. There's not enough chat about that out there. 100%. Setting a new future, speaking it into existence, talking about things that most people don't talk about. We got to lead the way, lead the way. Yeah. And this is why I wanted to invite you onto the Man on Purpose podcast. I truly believe you're a man on purpose. You've got a young family now and you've got this incredible business. You have so much value to give. I'd love to chat next time more about storytelling and uh everyone who wants to reach out to callum please connect with him the links will be around here as well um yeah any final comments any final insights into this whole conversation there's so so many great points <laughs> i'm not really i think um you know if if there's just one thing if there's anybody that's out there with an idea with with something that they want to you know, believes of value and, and feels like is their passion, they should get after it. Figure out how they can use that passion to help people and get started today. That's it. There is no better time but now. Thank you so much for your time, Callum. This has been been mind expanding. Uh, yeah, we could chat for hours, I'm sure. And um, congratulations on everything you're doing and I appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Zach. It's been fun. <laughs>